Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm I'm giving this presentation on behalf of Lydia because she's just had a lovely little baby, so she couldn't be here. Um, and this is part of a, a BBSRC funded project. Um, anyway, basically, go through, I don't need to go through these things. This is talk, talk done for somewhere else, but you'll know all the kind of uh, uh, routine stuff. But the African buffalo, called an ancestral reservoir of FMD, they are probably the origin of FMD. And if we look at the, um, the sampling, or at least the sequences available on GenBank, we have a tree here. And these, th these are um, all the sequences to show you that there's very small numbers of SAT viruses available or sequences <coughs> available. So part of the idea of this project is to um, increase that. And the, uh, what, what, what this has also been used for is to um, look at the five prime end sequences. I mean, the, the data we, we've got will be used for a lot of other things. But initially, and particularly looking at the S fragment, which is a, a huge stem loop um, upstream of poly C. So um, we talk about SAT viruses with non-SAT S fragments and those with um, uh, SAT-like S fragments. Now, here, what we have here is on the, on the left, um, the S fragment folded up of OAC Asia 1 and we can see it's bigger than the Southern African SAT uh, S fragment and these two are phylogenetically not really related the sequence differences are, are, are extremely large between these two but if we look at other places in Africa that we've sequenced for example in the Queen Elizabeth National Park in uh, southwest Uganda and also in various places in East Africa we see a longer S fragment, much more like the OAC. Uh, and again, these are generally not um, phylogenetically related. So we want to look at what's, what the genetic basis is of these unusual S fragments. Now if we look at um, phylogenetic trees, uh, this is the S fragment. And here we have what, what we call the Southern African or the common SAT fragments are all here and all the SAT 1, 2 and 3 all mixed together here. Here we look at OAC uh, Asia 1 and they form a cluster here and then these other two form different clusters. The, the purple one here being Queen Elizabeth National Park and uh, this uh, orangey coloured one being East Africa uh, where there's only SAT 1 and SAT 2. But in the Queen Elizabeth Park at least in, in one area there's also SAT 3. If we then look at the rest of the 5' prime UTR, we get a pretty similar story. Uh, and then VP1, it, cha it changes in VP1 and part of, parts of the capsid, because you then start to divide the, the groups by serotype. So the colours here are the different serotypes. But if, you, if we highlight these East African and Queen Elizabeth National Park samples, although they group by serotype, they start to fall into uh, groups that are separate to the southern African viruses and here's that's just showing the serotypes um, so they're showing distinct phylogenies if we look at the rest of the genome uh, the, the, the conserved at least the conserved protein or conserved protein coding regions then we find uh, a similar thing to the um, S fragment in that these group by um, geographic locations, i.e. Uh, um, OAC Asia 1 uh, being as non what we call non-African and uh, the Southern African SATs and then these two different areas in East Africa and we go through all, all of those and they're pretty similar. Um, so we, these, these are maximum likelihood trees and they suggest uh, distinct evolutionary pathways for these viruses. So we looked at um, a, a method which had been um, uh, in, invented by Peter Simmons and this is just showing how it works and basically taking, walking through a sequence, taking um, an area and then doing a tree, moving along, doing a tree and again and then doing trees and then looking at how m mapping on, on this kind of like heat map 
on how these um, uh, trees, how, con how congruent these trees are. And as you can see here, um, this is another thing for enteroviruses. What you see here is the capsid uh, has much less recombination than, say, the non-structurals or the, or the uh, five prime UTR. Now, if we apply that to the, to the viruses that uh, Lydia sequenced, and there's, uh, there's something in the region of she did about 50 um, sats in addition to the other ones, and um, what we can see again is the capsid region. You see very little evidence of recombination. When you look at either side of the capsid, what you see within this, the Southern African sap virus, or at least the sap viruses, is recombination within, and then the OACH1 you see recombination within that group, but not generally between the two. There's some bits and pieces in here, but you'll see why in a minute. Um, if we now highlight the two East African areas here in the middle, we see that, that they actually are not, um, not recombining very much, or are not, not apparent at least, with viruses in uh, OAC Asia 1 or with Southern African viruses. And therefore, we, we suggest that these um, viruses have evolved separately to the Southern African. Okay? So, parallel evolution. Now, why should that be? Well, this is kind of a very schematic idea of, of what, um, what Africa was like in terms of cattle and, cattle and buffalo distribution before the Rindipest pandemic of the 1890s. And what happened when Rindipest, Rindipest came into the, the Horn of Africa is that um, many of the FND susceptible animals died off. And people talk of 90 to 95% of animals being, uh, of dying. And there were scenes like this where just not only cattle but buffalo just dead everywhere. And before this time, Buffalo ranged almost constantly from southern Sudan through to the Cape, and this, this apart from the jungle areas, that you know was 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 full of buffalo. After the Indo-Pest pandemic, numbers of buffalo were concentrated in small areas, and um, and the numbers were very small. For example, uh, in Zimbabwe in the Wangi National Park here, numbers I think went down to maybe 300 buffalo. Or in fact, no, I tell a lie. They, they may have gone on lower than that. It was some years after the Rindipest pandemic, the numbers of buffalo built up to 300. So the numbers um, in some of these places were very different. And in fact, buffalo in, in most of South Africa uh, didn't have foot and mouth in after the Rindipest pandemic. It was only really the Kruger National Park where foot and mouth survived. So foot and mouth only survived in, in sporadic places. Um, this is a Bayesian tree just showing uh, the Southern African the, and then the um, East African and the Queen Elizabeth National Park to show that they're, they're very, very different. And this is a, of the 3C protease. And anyway, um, when foot and mouth re-emerged in Africa, uh, the sats re-emerged in, in Southern Africa in the 1930s. And... Uh, various other places at various times. So it's thought that in southeast Uganda and places in, e in East Africa, the viruses that were here are a remnant of a very much, um, a ver very much wider distribution of, of viruses that were really quite distinct over this whole area in Africa. And let's just go back a little. And basically, if, if you look at any odd places or any dis geographically distinct places and we have looked at places in Mozambique you should find quite different viruses and that's what happens no one's looked at forest buffalo for example in, in these kind of areas and the, the, if they do have foot and mouth then these ought to be very different to what we what we currently know and the other thing that we must not forget is that we, we also have some historical records and this is a letter from someone working in 
in Uganda back in the, in the 70s, communicating with Bob Hedger at Herbright, describing what had happened in that region going back to the eight, you know, before the Indopest pandemic and how all that, how that, all that went through. And there's one, one sentence here. He said, I believe that the Aishasha buffalo, which are in the uh, south part, part, part of the Queen Elizabeth National Park, where SAT3 was found, have probably not been in contact with cattle for at least 80 years. That was then, and maybe longer. So really, those cattle probably hadn't, those, those buffalo probably hadn't seen cattle since before the Rinderpest pandemic. And that's why we have viruses that are emerging from these areas, or not even emerging, they're, they're being sampled, uh, that, have, that have managed to persist in those herds of buffalo for, you know, 100 years or so. Um, so I'd like to thank various people at Purbright and then the, uh, the SLOLA project, which involves people at University of Leeds, St Andrews, uh, and University of Edinburgh and Dundee. Thank you. Elizabeth, okay, I'll give uh, one more question. Um, Nick, thank you so much. This is absolutely amazing information, this um, um, uh, evolution, independent evolution um, of the SAT viruses. Yep. Um, one question and then uh, we move on to the next speaker. Any more and, um, questions or communications with Nick or any of the other speakers? We will leave till after the, the session. Okay, thanks. Just a quick question. Um, that extension found on those in this fragment of those uh, sats uh, that are unusual, uh, could you trace that, that 50 nucleotide insertion to any O's or A's occurring in the north part of Africa? Uh, or where do you think that's coming from? Um, no, I mean, we are, we are starting to see deletions that happen in the S fragment in O, A and C, but, we, but not just in Africa, but in other parts of the world. And we're not, we don't understand why they're happening, what the difference is you know, what, what effect that's having in, on the viruses. But it does appear to be able to happen. It just appears that, so far, all the Southern African ones lost it at some stage. And we, we don't really know why or what it does. It's just an interesting observation at this time. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker, Tiziano, the waves of 